Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. Our guest today is the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. Mr. Secretary General, thank you for welcoming us here at the headquarters of NATO in Brussels. Thank you so much. It's been one year since you're in office and you spent a lot of your time and your energy on Ukraine, where you just paid your first visit, a very symbolic visit. There were a few technical agreements signed between NATO and uh, Ukraine. But most importantly, I'd like to have your on-the-ground assessment of the situation. Ukrainian top officials have been saying the ceasefire is taking hold. We're seeing positive developments mm -hmm. and the Minsk agreement might still be implemented. Do you share that guarded optimism? At least I share the, uh, the, you know, the guarded optimism that uh, we now see at least some encouraging signs in Ukraine. Because for the first time since the ceasefire was agreed last fall, uh, it now mainly holds. And, uh, and uh, this is of great importance because it's an important element in what we call the Minsk agreements. And uh, this has created some kind of renewed uh, uh, support and a renewed uh, effort to uh, implement the Minsk agreements. And uh, the situation is still fragile. It's a lot of uncertainty. The Russians are still uh, very much present in the eastern uh, what Ukraine. What kind of presence do you have? Because this has been a very hotly debated issue. There are still Russian troops, Russian weapons. What do you see? What's your Na NATO's uh, assessment? Well, so Russia continues to support the separatists in eastern Ukraine with weapons, with training, with command and control, and with forces. And this is based on NATO intelligence, but it's also based on open sources uh, from media, from uh, from reports and interviews with uh, soldiers, with the family of soldiers, uh, Russian soldiers who have been there. Uh, Russia is still sending troops to eastern Ukraine? The border is completely open, so, so troops, forces, equipment is moving back and forth. But there are troops, forces, equipment, uh, Russian controlled uh, in, uh, in eastern Ukraine uh, today. And there's also a lot of heavy weapons violating the uh, Minsk agreement, uh, which requires that heavy weapons are removed from, from the contact line or the, or, the, or the front line. So we still have a long way to go to have the full implementation of the Minsk agreement. But at least it is encouraging that the ceasefire now seems to be holding, and that is the first time since it was agreed uh, a year ago. And on the Ukrainian side, are they doing their part of the job as well, or are there still things they need to do to boost confidence? The Ukrainians also have, of course, to do more to have full implementation of the uh, Minsk agreements, but at least they are uh, doing a lot and they have uh, delivered a lot already. For instance, they passed uh, a, a law in the parliament uh, uh, providing the basis for uh, decentralization, for more self-governance uh, for certain regions uh, in eastern Ukraine. And this is an important part of the political implementation of the Minsk Agreement. And we uh, also have to remember that the whole problem is that the sovereignty, the territorial integrity, the borders of Ukraine are violated by uh, Russian-backed uh, separatists who are fully dependent on the support from uh, another country from Russia. Right. And Crimea is never going to go back to Ukraine. We will never uh, recognize or accept uh, the illegal uh, annexation of uh, uh, Crimea. Uh, that's the first time since the end of the uh, Second World War that one country has grabbed or annexed a part of another country in uh, Europe by the use of force. Uh, more broadly, the Russian uh, threats. There are reports that the U.S. military is, for the first time since the Cold War, drawing, reviewing contingency plans for an armed conflict with Russia because of the changing nature of the threats. Is NATO doing the same? So we are, we have, uh, we are constantly reviewing and developing our plans uh, because uh, uh, the main core task of NATO is to protect and defend uh, all allies against any threat. And when, and when uh, the threats and the challenges are changing, of course, we have to develop our plans. And, uh, and we are also uh, uh, changing our uh, posture in, in the way that we are now uh, implementing the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War. We have doubled the size of what we call the NATO Response Force. 
we have established a new high readiness force where the lead elements are able to move within as little as 48 hours. And we have increased the military presence of the Alliance in the east, uh, eastern part of the Alliance with more air policing, more training, uh, more uh, troops. Will there be permanent bases in those uh, countries? You recently uh, announced that there would be new command units. However, for Russia, you know that this is clearly a red line, having permanent NATO troops in those countries. Are you thinking that maybe you will need to get there to have more deterrence? So we have already increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance without establishing uh, big uh, uh, permanent bases or with combat troops. We do that partly by uh, having more exercises, more presence on uh, rotational bases, uh, more air policing in the air and more uh, presence uh, at sea with, uh, with ships and naval forces. But no permanent bases. I, I'm, I'm saying that we are able to have increased presence uh, without uh, uh, establishing permanent basis of large uh, combat troops uh, units. And, uh, and, uh, and in addition to increasing the presence in the eastern part of the alliance, which we have already done, we have also increased our ability to reinforce, uh, if uh, needed, with uh, the bigger uh, NATO response force and with this uh, high readiness uh, joint task force which is able to deploy within uh, very little time. Is the biggest threat uh, for the Baltic states from Russia? We don't see any imminent threat against any NATO ally. They're very concerned. And I, uh, I know that because I've been there several times. Uh, but uh, it's a response also to their concern that we have increased our presence and uh, that we are adapting and changing and, and, and implementing the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we do this both as a response to a more assertive Russia uh, in the East, uh, being responsible for aggressive actions in Ukraine, but we, uh, we also do it because we, we need to respond to the violence, to the turmoil uh, we see in the South, uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, North Africa. Well, which brings us to Syria. Mm. And the question everybody's asking these days, and I'm sure you're asking yourself and your intelligence officials the same, what is Russia up to in Syria? Uh, we are seeing more and more military presence, uh, probably uh, a base being built in the area of Latakia, reports that other sites. Do you think Russia is really building up in Syria to have really a strong, maybe permanent military basis there? So we see a substantial Russian buildup in uh, Syria uh, with uh, different kinds of capabilities, uh, so fighter planes, air defenses and other uh, kinds of modern military. Uh, Very quickly also. Yeah, it, this has happened during you know, the last weeks, uh, and it's a substantial military uh, build-up. Have you been surprised? It's, it's, it's too early to uh, determine exactly what are the intentions, and I encourage Russia to uh, play a constructive and cooperative uh, part uh, in the fight against ISIL. And I welcome that there are contacts between the United States, which is the lead nation in the coalition fighting ISIL, and uh, Russia. Uh, the but military the, to military relationship basically that was severed because of, of Ukraine seemingly has restarted because of Syria. Aren't you surprised by Well, you? we have always both NATO uh, as an alliance but also uh, individual NATO allies. Uh, we have always underlined that we will keep the channels for political and military to military contact open. Uh, despite of uh, the sanctions we have implemented uh, against Russia, the economic sanctions by the European Union, and the fact that uh, NATO has suspended all practical co cooperation, because I believe, NATO believes, that it is important to have direct dialogue, contact with Russia, especially when times are difficult as they are now. So Russia can play a constructive role in Syria? I will encourage Russia to do so, but it's too early to determine exactly what are the intentions and what are the purpose of this military build-up. If it is to support Assad, then... Could it, it be? Could it be? Of course, that's, uh, that's a possibility. And, uh, and uh, it's very hard, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to see that any support for Assad would be any kind of constructive uh, contribution to uh, solving the crisis, because Assad is part of the problem. Is responsible for atrocities, killing his own people, 
and therefore any support for him would not be a contribution uh, to a solution. But aren't practice. you hearing about Bashar al-Assad a different music? We hear Angela Merkel, John Kerry, François Hollande say, well, you know, we need to negotiate, we need to find a political solution. Don't you think that there is a shift happening right now vis-à-vis -vis Bashar al-Assad from key Western leaders? What I think is that it, it is important both to continue uh, the military uh, operations against uh, ISIL and uh, all NATO allies participate in, uh, in that in one way or another in Iraq and or Syria. Uh, at the same time, it is extremely important to support all efforts, uh, and especially the efforts by the, the UN, uh, to find a political uh, peaceful solution because the, in the long run there is no military a solution to the uh, crisis in Syria. It has to be a negotiated solution and I welcome the efforts uh, which are, are now taken to try to find a political solution. Uh, speaking of a NATO country uh, that's been pretty much in the news because of uh, Syria and, and Iraq, Turkey. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Defense Secretary uh, criticized Turkey for not being active enough in, in the airstrikes against ISIL and for not uh, controlling it, its borders, saying basically that Turkey is fighting the PKK more than ISIL. Do you share that assessment? Turkey is the ally which is most affected by the crisis, the violence and the turmoil both in Iraq and in Syria, bordering both uh, countries. They have received uh, over a million refugees and, uh, and uh, Turkey uh, is now contribu contributing uh, to the fight against ISIL. Enough? They do uh, more than most other NATO allies, uh, partly by uh, participating in the airstrikes against uh, ISIL, partly by uh, feeling the effects of the migrant crisis more than any other NATO uh, uh, ally. Then we all have to uh, look into how can we do even more, how, how, how can we do it in a more effective way. And this is a debate which is ongoing all the time. NATO will now start what we call defense capacity building in Iraq, meaning help to train, advise and assist uh, the Iraqi government to increase their capacity to defend themselves and to also fight uh, ISIL. Okay, Mr. Secretary General, thank you very much for answering uh, our questions. And thank you for watching this edition of the interview here from Brussels.